This has been some, some week in uh, British politics, hasn't it? The, uh, the Scottish referendum result has got massive implications for not just devolution in, in England, but transport in England. And one of the lessons we, we've learned over the last 15 years since we've seen devolution uh, go to London and the Scottish Parliament being devolved, Welsh Parliament as well, the Welsh Assembly, what we've seen is that devolution is actually good for transport, especially in London and Scotland. London and Scotland have achieved things on the transport front that people in the north of England in particular are very envious about. Interesting question, I'm going to pose this. Why has the north of England not done nearly as well as they should have done, even under a Labour government? What is the reason for that? Is it, is it that, that we're not effective in the north of England at lobbying? I used to chair the Northern Way Transport Group, which brought the three regional development agencies together in the north of England. And the one lesson I learned was that in the north of England, we don't, we don't punch our weight. And if you want to see evidence of that, just have a look at the state of some of the rolling stock going into some of our cities here in the north of England. So, key question, how is the north of England in particular going to grasp what opportunity is going to come from constitutional change? And it's really appropriate tonight, because I was wondering, I knew that uh, Andrew Donis was here as former Secretary of State for Transport and also as uh, Shadow Secretary of the Infrastructure. And, you know, just, just a quick word about Andrew. There's two types of Secretary of State. There's a Secretary of State who goes into the department and kind of manages it, it doesn't shift the agenda. Or there's a Secretary of State who goes in and grabs the department and the civil servants by the scruff of the neck and says, this is the direction I want to take you in. That is exactly what Andrew did on High Speed and High Speed 2. And it's a credit to Andrew that we are where we are on this debate now. And, and the sooner you get back into government, Andrew, the better. And then, when I saw Stephen Twig on the agenda, I thought, mm, what's, what's this got to do with transport? And then I, I don't know if you planned this, Philip, but because Stephen is the, the Shadow Secretary for the Constitution, he's now got one of, the, one of the hottest jobs in the Labour Shadow Cabinet. How do we make this work? A quick plea. Do not go down the road of an English Assembly. Because a, an English Assembly will not deal with the geographical differences that exist across England. And the last thing people in the northeast or the northwest want is to have policies dictated to them by an English assembly which will be dominated by London in the southeast. So what do we have to do in terms of devolution? Well, we're, just, we're in a seat of government right here. And you just have to look around this room to realize the power that bodies like Manchester had in the past. So the more we can build on city regions, given the city regions in the north of England, the type of powers that Transport for London have got, the better. Anyway, that's, uh, that's enough for me. I want to uh, introduce our speakers tonight. So, and the baton order is going to be first, Andrew Donis, second, uh, Stephen Twigg, thirdly, we're going to have the Mayor of Liverpool, Joe Anderson, and then last, to, to, to mop up by him, we're going to have Philip Blonde from Res Publica. Let's give a really warm round of applause, because he deserves it, to Andrew Donis. David, thanks. And also, thanks to you for the huge, hugely important leadership you've given to the transport debate in your various different roles over the decades, David. Uh, transport Thank Times you. is, for those of you who are, who are transport experts, I mean, is the place where these big debates happen. And indeed, it was the, uh, one of um, uh, David and his colleague Adam Raphael, who's, a, uh, who's a, his other partner in developing Transport Times, who I had the early conversations with about high-speed rail, which persuaded me that this was the right direction uh, in which to go in terms of international transport trends and policies, which, of course, the problem with this country is that we seem to think too often that because things happen in other countries, it's a bad idea that they should happen here. The fact that high-speed rail is now the thing in virtually every other developed economy of our size in the world, I take, but this is a slightly heretical notion I take to be a positive reason for doing it, <laughs> not a negative reason. Uh, and it was Transport Times that brokered those talk talks. Delighted to, to, to be on the panel with my good friend uh, Stephen uh, Twig and with the wonderful originator of Philip, the originator of this fantastic think tank, and the Mayor of Liverpool, who has led the way in many of these debates and has told me he's now keen to become the elected Mayor of Merseyside. Now, there is a very important constitutional development for you in due course, so we should give him a big round of applause. <laughs> if, uh, 
if my own view, and look, I'm always a bit ahead of the, the pack on these things, but my own view is if we are going to make regional devolution work in England, it has to have an elected component to it. The city regions are the first place where I think you can make this work, because we've got these things called combined authorities, which already have the local authorities coming together. This is not taking power away, emphatically not taking power away from the existing local authorities, but enabling more devolution to take place to the city regions, and nowhere is that more important than in strategic transport planning, where, of course, London has had this now in an elected way since the mayor was set up, but the GLC had it before. And my own view is you will not get sufficient legitimacy to be able to devolve the whole lot, including very large budgets, unless there is an elected component to it. So elected Mayor Anderson could be a real trailblazer for this and make it possible to have really substantial devolution. Enter HS2 and HS3. Now, uh, let me just talk about the rationale for both of them and why they're, they're so important. Um, HS2 has three rationales, and they are mutually reinforcing. The first is capacity. We cannot carry on for the next generation retrofitting a Victorian railway, which is, is at, near at capacity now, will be at capacity in, within the next 10 years, and can only be, have its capacity further increased by massively expensive further upgrades. There is no free lunch here. We had just finished four years ago a 10 billion, so in HS2 money, probably now the, the contemporary equivalent of 15 billion upgrade to the West Coast Main Line. Those of you who use it frequently, do you remember the week after week mm. where the thing was closed? Mm. Indeed, it's still periodically closed. It was nearly three hours coming up to Manchester on Sunday because of, of large scale engineering works that were taking place on part of the line there. This is what you will have to go through unless you invest in uh, new intercity capacity between these major conurbations. So there's a massive capacity argument for it. We either have to go through another upgrade of the, I say the Victorian Railway, the London and Birmingham Railway is pre-Victorian. It was actually opened for the coronation of Queen Victoria in 1838 to bring people down to see it. But the second argument is connectivity. We have got to bring our big metropolitan centres of the Midlands, the North and London closer together. We have this phenomenal resource of phenomenal cities which are uh, great centres of, of uh, both production and consumption, which is what makes them so successful. They're great places to live and go, as well as being economic centres. They're in reasonable proximity. With HS2, we can bring them all to essentially within commuting distance of each other. It's not just London, but of each other. So HS2, half an hour London to Birmingham, then half an hour Birmingham to Manchester, a, a, a bit more to Liverpool, or slightly than Manchester, though there is this issue I know of, but whether you have the direct link to Liverpool, I, I won't opine on that one at the moment. Other views will be <laughs> expressed after me on that one, I know. Uh, and then half an hour through to uh, the East Midlands and then up to Leeds. This is transformational in terms of the connectivity of our, uh, our major conurbations. And remember, the, what we have up to now is, is very poor, not just because it's so slow, but because it was never intended to be joined up. Remember what actually happened in the Victorian era, because these were all freestanding private companies, is all of the major cities built their own freestanding lines to London. So the London and Birmingham Railway was built separately from the LNWR and the line to, to Manchester. So if you're going, it's not just that the journey times are very slow from London to Birmingham and to Manchester, but they're incredibly slow going from Birmingham to Manchester or to Liverpool, where there are the uh, uh, because that's not part of the um, uh, of the direct West Coast Main Line. Whereas with HS2, you get London, Birmingham. Birmingham acts as the big junction going up to the northwest and the northeast. So the connectivity is um, is is hugely uh, in, in, improved, and therefore, thirdly, the economic benefit is going to be uh, commensurate uh, as well. And, of course, the, since the alternative to doing this is, as I say, is very expensive upgrades of the existing, existing infrastructure to get less gain, this is not attractive. Now, HS3, as it's been dubbed, is equally important because what that essentially acts is, as, is, the cross, is the cross rail of the north. These Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, and then on to Hull and Newcastle in the east, the distances are not great. Uh, the connectivity is appalling. And I started the process by announcing the electrification of the Liverpool to Manchester line, which we did in, in government, which was the first step to upgrading it, to give the current lot credits, what they've now turned this into. They then announced Manchester to Leeds as a, as a, as a further electrification, and they're now looking at options, which, which the Chancellor will publish in, uh, in, um, 
in the autumn on how this can be turned into a higher speed line. Now, given the distances involved, this could turn into literally a cross rail of the north, you know, 20-minute connections between these major cities. As I put it in the House of Lords recently, this, the train called the Trans-Pennine Express, <laughs> which takes an hour to do the, what, the 38, more than an hour to do the 38 miles from Manchester to Leeds, and of course then goes on to Liverpool slowly on the west and on to Manchester, is the greatest misnomer in the modern age apart from my own name. And, it need, and this, does huge, this does huge damage to the economies of the north. What we need is, is really transformed connectivity and capacity, both between the conurbations of London, the, the, the Midlands and the north, and across the north. So we need HS2 and we need HS3. And when do we need them? As soon as possible. They're, both, they're very important investments in their own right for capacity. They're big capacity issues in terms of the railways between these cities, but also for connectivity. And just one word about how we should handle the politics of this. I started HS2, the Labour government uh, took, it, took it forward before the last election. I tried my, uh, everything I did everything I could to try and make it a cross-party project. I opened the books to the Tories, the line and all of that, and I think that that was the right thing to do. It's part of the reason why the legislation on HS2 passed the House of Commons uh, uh, a few months ago with a majority of 10 to 1. If we had tried to make this a big infrastructure, has to be cross-party. Now, it's generally quite a good thing to try and get a cross-party consensus behind your own ideas. If you can do that, then that's a double, a, a double win. Now, HS3, it looks as if it's this government that will publish the plan in the autumn for HS3. A word of advice to the party, if it's a good plan and it does deliver, and it offers transformed connectivity and capacity between the major conurbations of the north, we should come in really strongly behind it. No ifs, no buts, we should be there. If we can turn this into a big cross-party project to transform connectivity between the cities of London, the Midlands and the north, and across the north, then uh, that is a great thing for us to do for our communities and all the more reason why Labour should do it because most of these communities which we're serving look to us for leadership and if we can get that leadership started under the present government then when we win the next election we then have plans already embedded which the Conservatives have supported so when the legislation comes forward it's very hard for them to do U-turns and all of that and the money and so we should then be there solidly behind them so that in I hope a short period of time, 10 years time I think we could do the um, uh, HS3, 15 years to get HS2 completed. We will look back on this thing called the Trans-Pennine Express and the, the, these extremely antiquated Pendolino trains that made you sick as they sort of as lurched around every bend and, and, uh, and, and still uh, pretty comparatively slow into the bargain and we'll say, goodness, that was the Stone Age. Now we're a truly <laughs> modern and joined up country. Thank you. Andrew, well done. Does anyone want to use Wi-Fi? <laughs> I'll be told to announce this. This is the, the network is Wi-Fi Love MCR. And the password is internet, lowercase. Wow. I was asked to do that, but just I don't know. It might have just fallen. Did, yeah. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> uh, Andrew, fantastic stuff. And we'll, we'll come back to this. But I, I just, you're, you're spot on. There's no way that Labour can be outflanked by George Osborne on high speed three. Right, this is, this is Labour started this project. We have got to be seen to be to the forefront in delivering for the north, the north of England. Stephen, welcome. It's not it's the first time I've seen you at a transport debate. Yeah. Huh? I'm it's intrigued. Good to be what, here. I mean, was, was, this all, was all this constitutional stuff going to, when it was planned? We, was did, we it, planned we, we, it all. We thought for And you thought it was yeah. going yeah. to be important. Yeah. It's nothing to do with me being a Liverpool MP. <laughs> Oh, of it's course, I shouldn't. Say in, case, in case you're wondering, you didn't recognise my Scouse well, well, accent. Well, in, in case you're wondering why I'm not on the programme, I was only asked to do this a few days ago, so I'm kind of just getting up to speed with all that. But anyway, welcome, David. Thank you, Look, David. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, good evening, everyone. And I'm delighted to be here. And real thanks to Respublica, who I think are a, a first-class think tank. I worked with you when I was doing education, and really pleased to now be working together on some of these big constitutional challenges. And really, I just want to say two things, mostly about how this fits in to the debate we're now having after the Scottish referendum on the Constitution, and then just a little bit about Liverpool and the 20 miles more campaign. It's fantastic to speak after Andrew. I've known Andrew for over 25 years. Uh, I endorse everything David said about Andrew's record in government, in transport, but also in education 
uh, as well. He's a, he's a thinker, but he's also uh, a doer. And can I also endorse what you said about Joe? I mean, Joe, Joe's leadership in Liverpool over this last four and a half years has been absolutely extraordinary. Uh, to consider that the city is losing half the money that it's getting from central government, and yet he's able to deliver in so many of the key areas, not least on the economic challenges around jobs and apprenticeships and an industrial future uh, for the city. So it's a, a pleasure to be here with Joe. And I remember when the legislation on elected mayors was going through, Joe and I both took the view um, that it would have made far more sense to have had uh, an elected mayor for the whole of Merseyside because the kind of functions that are uh, performed at a city regional basis are actually very similar to the functions that are performed in London and that mayoral model. And I hope that we can get that back on the agenda as part of our discussion. So last week, Ed announced that we will be having a constitutional convention. And I think this is a hugely important opportunity to get something right that has been fundamentally wrong with our politics and system of government for a very long time. And it has direct relevance to today's debate, really for reasons that David gave when you spoke at the beginning, David. You look at what's happened in Scotland, you look at what's happened in London, that model of democratic leadership on a national basis in Scotland, a city regional basis in London, has delivered in many areas, including in transport. So what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks is working out uh, region by region how we best engage with not just politicians, but much more importantly engage with those on the ground, in local government, in business, in trade unions, in civil society, and the general public to work out region by region what this will mean, what the level of devolution will be, what the nature of devolution will be, so that we can correct this long-standing over-centralisation of power in Whitehall and Westminster. And that is where this debate needs to be. And it needs to be cross-party. We need to engage people from other parties. And it needs to be not just about parties. And that's why I talked about a people-led constitutional convention, so we can engage people in that way. And there may be an opportunity for more discussion about that in, after we've had the speeches. Let me just say one or two things about Liverpool and then, and then I'll finish, um, uh, David, because I think uh, Andrew set out the case on both HS2 and HS3 and I endorse uh, everything that he said. Uh, I think Joe and Philip will speak more about the campaign, uh, the 20 miles more campaign. But as a Liverpool MP, I want to say how important I think it is that we do connect Liverpool direct to high speed two. Liverpool is the largest city in the country that will not be on the current plan directly connected to HS2 trains will use the high speed line for part of the journey and then transfer onto existing tracks. Uh, this would mean in terms of speed that uh, Liverpool trains will spend half the journey on 19th century tracks and only half on the high speed tracks and this has real risks uh, economically for Liverpool. So I think it's crucially important that we get this we need to think, I think, during our discussion today about how we win that argument, how we build the broadest possible alliance, not just in the Liverpool city region, but more generally, so that the enormous benefits that will come from HS2 for the country as a whole are shared properly by Liverpool. And I'm sure we're going to hear more about that now from Joe and from Philip. Well, let's do it. Mayor of, Mer Mayor, Mayor of Merseyside sounds good, isn't it? Because, I mean, the key, the key issue here is that you, whatever the, 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 the tier of government is, you want it to cover a travel-to-work area, don't you? And, and right now, you're dependent on voluntary partnerships to make it work, Joe? Well, I, I think it, I, I always make the point that in Liverpool, for instance, um, you have, um, for, in, in the city centre of Liverpool, around, around about 72% of the people that work in Liverpool city centre actually come from uh, the region. So, you know, for, for me, it, it is absolutely a no-brainer that we work closer together. And, and people argue about, about this, whether that could be a combined authority or, or, or a, a metro mayor. For me, I've always been passionate around the metro mayor, quite simply because what's wrong with having a democratically accountable model where people can actually vote you in or vote you out on a manifesto? And if it's good for Paris and it's good for European countries and it's good for the rest of the civilised world who modernised, and it's good enough for Liverpool, if it's good enough for London, it certainly is good enough for uh, Liverpool. 
And, and I'm sure, as I said, we'll engage in, in, in that debate. Um, two, two things from me. On, on uh, the point of Andrew Adonis, I just simply want to make the point with Andrew Adonis as somebody uh, that I've known for a long time. And quite simply, uh, you know, uh, two words, uh, or three if you like, uh, describe him. He gets it. Yeah, I think that just sums him up. He gets it. And whether it's in uh, education or whether it's in transport or any other influential part he plays in government, he gets it. So, um, but moving on, David, I'm going to challenge you a little bit, and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, as I always usually am, a bit controversial, and even in uh, our own heartlands here of the Labour Party conference, you know, you said that we don't want to be outflanked on HS3, which is Andrew's point. We were nearly outflanked on HS2. Let's be absolutely clear about that. And it took me and it took the other core city leaders to argue the case really passionately and strongly for HS2 to continue because we had the absurd, absurd position of our own government making uh, soundings in Westminster talking about the need to invest in austerity, in infrastructure to actually push our country on, but then saying that HS2 might be a risk too much or it might be an investment too far. And we nearly lost that. Uh, debate. So uh, I accept the fact you, you make the point and you need to make the point about not being uh, outflanked on, on HS3, but we nearly were outflanked on HS2 and we cannot, we cannot let that happen again. I simply uh, make that point. With regards to you know, HS2, uh, look, whether it, uh, it connected into Liverpool uh, or not, uh, the importance of investment in infrastructure, modernising the infrastructure of the, of the nation, was crucially important, and if we weren't doing it while our competitors were, then that clearly uh, made a huge, you know, give us a huge disadvantage. And as far as I was concerned, I was always behind HS2, irrespective of whether it did connect into Liverpool. But the economic case uh, and the case for it to connect into Liverpool is simply this: 20 miles more. 20 miles more. Just remember that, because that's all it needs to connect into Liverpool. 20 miles more. And if I had, and I'm being honest with, with people in this room, if I had the choice between investing in HS2 or investing in HS3, I'd invest in HS3. Because we need to get the North West more competitive and more able to actually do things for itself. And that's why you can't, in my view, have HS2 without having HS3. It really is that simple. And as we look in Liverpool, and I'll make the case for Liverpool just simply by saying we're investing £350 million in a super poor concept. 90% of the freight that, that comes in uh, comes in through the south of, of, of the country. And yet 60% of it is consumed in the north, beyond Birmingham. And, and as HS2 and the report actually said, we need to, we believe that, the, this is what the report said, we believe that demand for carrying freight by rail will only grow. Industry is concerned by rising diesel prices, which they predict will, will uh, rise by 36% uh, by uh, 2040. So they see rail as playing an increasing role in transport and freight to maintain affordable prices for our goods in the future. Now, if that's the case and we accept that it is, then if that freight's coming into Liverpool, it's right that we have a connection from the west right the way through to the east. And it means it goes through Manchester, it means it goes through Leeds, and right the way through to Hull, from one uh, estuary in, in the Mersey to the Humber in Hull. And it's absolutely right that we get both of those things right. And I think, for me, you know, we can make, and I can make, the economic case about Liverpool growing as a city, one of the eight biggest cities uh, with, within the UK, one of the core cities. And I can make that case, and we will make that case, and we are presenting that case. We presented it to uh, the Chancellor, and we presented it to uh, shadow ministers as well, making that strong point about the need for that connectivity in. And it is simply a question about investing and investing for the future, making sure that, that we can work together with core cities in the north to actually grow the economy of the north. You know, it's, it's ironic, isn't it, that when we talk about investments and when we talk uh, about investments in the north, the HS3 is going to cost probably somewhere around about uh, 12 to £15 billion. Pounds. And if you look at that in comparison to Crossrail, 
And then if you look at that in comparison to what uh, Transport for London is asking, £50 billion, at least over the next 30 years, it's absolutely right that we make sure that we articulate that case for HS3 to connect the north and to make sure that we're not left behind in that investment. So, you know, I, I don't believe there's anybody in this room uh, that is against that. And I don't believe that there's anybody <coughs> with any common sense that is against that. It just simply is about making sure that we're bold enough and actually, uh, um, you know, if you like, strong enough to actually take that case and make that case for HS3 and HS2 together. Because I believe that one is, is absolutely uh, essential to make sure that the other one is even <coughs> successful. Because it is about the capacity. Not, it's not just about... And whoever labelled this as high speed done us a great deal of damage. Because people are talking about, well, this investment for, for just to get there a little bit faster. Well, it isn't about that. It isn't about that. It's about the capacity to move freight across the country as well. And we need it. And there is no uh, sense of, of, because of austerity and because of tough times, to stop investing in the future. And I simply say that that case, for me, is overwhelming. And it should be supported by the Labour Party wholeheartedly. Uh, and we should be making sure that we're not left behind by the Conservatives making that case we need to make it even more so, even more strongly than they do, because it is about, it is about not just the regeneration of the North West, it's about the regeneration of the UK, which the North West belongs to, too. Well done, George. Fantastic to attend a fringe meeting at a Labour Party conference on High Speed 2 without the subject being, should we build it or not? Because mm -hmm. for the last five years, all the fringes, there have been loads of them, we've run plenty ourselves, mm -hmm. it's been all about, should we build it or not? Half the room was against, and you had all the vociferous supporters from the home counties coming up telling you why we shouldn't build High Speed 2. It's wonderful. Is there anyone opposed to it? <laughs> You're welcome, uh, but it, uh, you're very welcome. <laughs> honestly, I do like debate, but it's wonderful that we're now moving on. Now, <laughs> so shut up. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll bring you in, honestly. I'll, we love debate. Uh, now, for, uh, here's the thing about a big project like this cross party support for it is absolutely invaluable and crucial. Do you think there's a risk that if the Conservatives go into opposition, that they might change their position on High Speed 2? What we desperately need is strategic thinking in the Conservative Party that recognises what happened in Scotland is happening to it in the North. And it's not good for this country to have a part of the country where one of our national parties isn't represented. Because, frankly, they start being a different country, and that's no good to any of us. So paradoxically, and I know this is odd to say a, a Labour Party conference, <laughs> but for the good of the country, we need a strong Tory presence in the North. We need a Conservative Northern option. And actually, uh, though I have profound disagreements with him on almost every issue, I think one has to acknowledge that George Osborne has been visionary here. I mean, I certainly don't think the super city is between Manchester and Leeds, not least because twice as many people travel between uh, Liverpool and Manchester as they do Manchester and Leeds. But thank goodness we have that northern vision. I mean, just to, to put uh, the issues in, in context, one of the things that I found so disturbing about the Scottish referendum was that everyone heaved a sigh of relief and thought that the issue was somehow profoundly addressed. All the areas that voted to break with one of the great unions of history were those that had higher rates of unemployment than the Scottish average, where they felt completely abandoned and forgotten. Mm -hmm. And I'm afraid I have to say they were abandoned and they are forgotten. And I think that also applies to far too many areas of the North. Far too many of our cities are abandoned and are forgotten. Because, it's, uh, because we've had, for reasons we can discuss, an ideological agreement between left and right that the only game in town was globalisation, and the only game in town is responding to it in the same way. And if that meant that we let the North wither on the vine, 
If that meant we abandoned Wales to its, to its economic fate, then so be it. There's literally nothing we can do. And the trouble with that sort of politics and that sort of vision is it comes back to you in the most aggressive and frightening form, and that's the ending of our settlement as a country and as a nation. And if we don't want divided nations, and we've already got them, by the way, uh, as I say often, the best predictor of a person's outcome in this country is the postcode where they're born, which is a horrific thought. And we know that the nature of modern capitalism is creating a world where fewer and fewer people win, but those who win, win more and more. Where the middle classes are getting proletarianized, and very few people's wages actually make ends meet. So what do you do? We, had, we at Res Public had a great discussion with Stuart Wood last night. And he was, just, he was arguing, and I think in this, Labour's ahead of the Conservatives. He was arguing, look, there's something profoundly wrong with modern capitalism. And I think that, that recognition isn't widely shared enough across the Conservative Party. It's shared by some noble people, uh, Tim Montgomery being one of them who's, who's here today, but it's not widely shared, and the country has paid the cost of that. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do to actually not abandon people? Well, for me, HS2 and HS3 are part of the crucial answer for what rebalancing a country genuinely would mean. Just inflating and creating jobs and employment is good, but it's not going to save anybody very much from anything. For most people uh, who are already in trouble, they will continue to be in trouble. They will just have low-paid jobs and enter the labour market and then leave it and live lives of permanent insecurity. Part of the, the argument, in fact, the only argument for HS2 really is HS3. HS3 makes the argument because it actually creates both a connection with one of the world's great cities, but also, crucially, the trade between, uh, between the cities that can actually genuinely get us out of where we are. Just some statistics to show how bad things are in the greater city that isn't connected to HS2. Liverpool currently has all sorts of gaps with national averages. Let me just give you some of them. We need 18,500 more businesses in Liverpool just to meet the national average. We need an additional 35,000 individuals to become economically active who are just to meet the national average. We need another 46,000 people to get jobs just to meet the national average. There's a whole, there's a shortfall of 90,000 jobs in the local economy and the household deficit per, per person is £1,700. That's greater than the subsidy given to Scotland, by the way. That's an 8.2 billion gap. Now, and if, we, if we're happy with this, if we're happy to let our people and our cities and, our great, and the great legacies that, that are there wither on the fine, so be it. But I'm not happy with that. The crucial thing about HS2, the 20 miles more, and I'd like to acknowledge Andrew Morris, who has led and set up uh, 20 miles more, who's helped make this possible, and, and to him we're extremely grateful. Um, if, we hadn't, if we don't get this, Liverpool is condemned to being one of those abandoned seaside towns that we don't visit any longer. And this is madness. This is madness of an unbelievable scale, because guess what? Liverpool is next to our greatest trading partner, the island of Ireland, through whom, <laughs> through whom all manner of goods and services come. And where will they come? Through Liverpool. Because Liverpool has the only, the only post-Panamax port on the western coast. What's post-Panamax? That is a port large enough to take the containerized ships that can now pass through or will shortly be able to pass through the widened Panama Canal. This will change the patterns of world trade. And even now, the estimates that we have for what will come through Liverpool, are, we're saying three times the, number, the level of freight. And there's absolutely no calculation in any of the uh, arguments for why HS2 wasn't put into Liverpool that accounts for the fact we will need to create additional capacity for that phrase anyway. So there's even a double simplistic return from putting HS2 direct into Liverpool, and that is we free the lines for the freight that we know is coming, and it's probably going to be even greater. And then all of that investment that we have in the post-Panamax port also feeds into Manchester. And Manchester and Liverpool are, as I've said, the true potential super city of the north. 
A, Liverpool is quite simply one of the most beautiful places in the world to live, and you can work in Manchester, or indeed work and live, uh, it work, uh, live in Manchester and work in Liverpool. This is the great growth region of the north that we just have to unlock. And HS3 is part of what will unlock it. Now, what the arguments we have to make are, I think, let's be frank and clear. To Labour, Labour isn't clear on, on HS2, so it's not even clear on HS3. And we need to listen to what Lord Adonis and Stephen have argued for. And actually, we need to organise both on the Liverpool side with Liverpool MPs and yep. with, with Andrew yep. to actually make this case. If we genuinely believe in rebalancing, welfare won't do it, entitlements won't do it, infrastructure that changes human opportunity is the only thing that will deliver. And do you know how much it costs? It's a little hard to say, but roughly experts think, and you have to be slightly careful because we're not sure, on whether the, the rail track will run west or east of Warrington, around 1.5 billion. And yet, in the latest economic study that we have, the yearly benefits, and this is the yearly benefits in gross value per added, are already 557 million. And that was part of a very good package put, put to the Department of Transport by Mersey Travel, who I think have, have done an excellent job in creating a very compelling case. So we're looking at actually HS2 uh, connecting directly into Liverpool, having something like eight times the benefit of any other stretch of line. Why is that? Because actually the original calculations HS2 made for why they didn't go into Liverpool were based on the wrong data. First of all, it was based on the wrong census data that actually argued Liverpool city region was falling in population when actually it's rising. It was based on a far narrower area, on 1.5 million people, when actually the city region is 2.3 million people. And it failed to take account of the type of growth that Liverpool can expect in the future. So even on their own case, I think the exclusion of Liverpool isn't to be supported. And we desperately need the Labour Party to come to the realisation that the way forward, the way to transform the lives and outcomes of people who live in those areas that have been abandoned by the politics and the economics of the last 30, 40 years is through this type of infrastructure. For the Conservatives, I think we need to make quite a, a clear strategic case. There is no future majority for you unless you can have MPs in the North. And if the, if the Conservative Party can recognise and actually be ahead of Labour, and make commitments to the North that the Labour Party hasn't previously given, and it can be pro-HS3 and pro-East, uh, the East-West link. The clear long-term strategic advantages to that are obvious. So actually, as I've argued before, we have a unique political opportunity as well as a compelling economic argument. And if we can deliver this, then think of what else we can deliver. And finally, let's think creatively. Let's think of ways of capturing land value for this type of extension, just as Crossrail has done by raising a levy on certain rateable values above a certain size. There's no reason if this will deliver the type of uh, increases in land values that it's arguing for, and I'm looking at, uh, at uh, we have million, tens of millions, uh, 179 million per year, single year rise in land values along the link. Why not use part of that increase in land value to finance this sort of infrastructure? And then we can knock even the very small 1.5 billion figure down to something less even than that. The case is compelling. The fact we don't do it is a standing indictment of our contemporary settlement. Thank you. Well done, sir. Very compelling arguments. Uh, now, I know everyone hears it from Liverpool, and just in case you're wondering why there's so much at this <laughs> conference about Liverpool, it's because Liverpool kindly supporting this event tonight, but that doesn't mean to say we're ignoring Manchester or Leeds or Newcastle mm -hmm. or powerhouses in the North England, but I think a really compelling case has been put as to why Liverpool should be connected to the High Speed 2 network. Now, let's go to questions. Neil Dawson, uh, councillor in the city of Leeds. L Leeds has been very unfortunate. It's the largest city in Western Europe without a rapid transit system. We've been trying for 34 years to get one. The latest version is a trolleybus scheme, which 
went to the, the, the design stage in 2006. It was approved by the city council two and a half years ago. But we actually won't put a spade in the ground until 2017. My question is, why is that process taking so long and why can't we speed that up? And equally, on the HS2 debate, why does it have to start in the south and come north? Why can't it start in the north and come south? The south of Leeds, where there will be a new station, is in urgent need of regeneration. And it would benefit that area, the communities around Holbeck and Hunslet in South Leeds, tremendously to start that. Well done, Neil. I actually Thank thought you. last week when the Better Together campaign were offering all sorts of bribes to Scotland to stay in the Union, I thought that was going to be the rabbit out of the hat. We're going to build high-speed rail from Edinburgh and Glasgow first and come, <laughs> and come south. <laughs> Uh, we'll come to that question. Good question. Gentlemen, right at the back. I, Paul will actually use the Trans Pennine trains quite a lot. And I think the standard service... Paul, introduce yes? yourself. I, sorry, I did, but I'll do it again. Paul oh, Wheeler. Sorry, yeah. and, and my claim to fame is really I use the Trans Pennine Express quite a lot. Yeah. And I think the standard service is such, it was summed up when I asked the guard, could I charge my phone? Did it have a socket? And he said, I was lucky to have windows on the train. <laughs> <laughs> right? So anyone who's used it, that's where... But I, I, yeah. I don't know if Lord Adonis has gone or... But, but, Mine's a bit of a technical question. Yeah, if it's so obvious, and I hear what Phil Bond says quite well, who's making the decision? And how do we influence them? Because in, in a world of devolution, shouldn't we be making the decision to fund the 20 miles and high speed too, rather than some obscure treasury official using out of date statistics? But I don't know what's going to happen. Because yeah. it is obvious, but why doesn't it happen? And good who's point. making the decision to say no? It's a good point, Paul, because in devolved Scotland, they have the powers if they want to build high-speed rail for the Scottish border. Great. So why can't we? Yeah, well, we don't have the devolved powers yet, but that's coming. We're going to get Stephen's going to make an announcement tonight. We, on this. we could ask Andrew in the red tie, <laughs> just there Andrew? by the camera. Yeah. Hi, uh, uh, my name is Andrew Morris from Twenty Miles More. Um, it was great to hear all of the, the representations by the panel today. Um, I think they made some really interesting points and um, put forward. I think Joe and Stephen and Philip very eloquently put forward Liverpool's case for being on high speed too. Um, my, my question really is um, high speed two, high speed three have kind of, um, kind of marginalized Liverpool. It's not really at the heart of the, of the message. It's, not, it's kind of an afterthought. And my question is what kind of um, rebalancing of the economy can we expect if we don't pull in our, our fifth largest metropolitan area, Liverpool. Great. Well, let, let's start off. Uh, question, question, Neil, from these. Why does, it, why does it take so long to get anything done in this country? I've got, I could, I've got a good idea how to answer that, but I'm going to leave it, because I'm supposed to be chair. Go on, you answer. No, 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 no. I have no, no idea no. what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think, you know, look, uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, th I think that's a decision that clearly your transport funding would have been allocated to you in the same way as, as cities are. I mean, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not the best and, it, and it's not uh, the greatest. I clearly know that Liverpool uh, similarly has had a, a massive reduction in, in tra transport infrastructure uh, funding. What, and, and why there's a delay, uh, 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 you know, I mean, again, uh, I guess that that's something that the you know lead city council uh, and Nick and, and the MPs should take up and, and, and challenge and champion and embarrass. Really, that, that, I think that's all I can I, I can say. If that was happening uh, in Liverpool, I'd be uh, I'd be making a lot of noise and I'd be making sure my MPs uh, in, in the city who we work closely with would also make lots of noise. So I, I, I don't know why you know there's a there's a delay. Um, I, so, you know, but that's, all, that's what I'd do if it was the case in Liverpool. Okay. Let's come on to the, let's come on to the question uh, about Liverpool, the point from Andrew. Okay. And Andrew, it's good, to, it's good to see someone from the business community come forward and start to be so proactive in this campaign for connectivity to Liverpool and high-speed rail. But, I mean, Andrew's point about, is Liverpool disadvantaged and how much is it disadvantaged and what can we do about it? And I, I think, can I echo what David just said about Andrew and, and the campaign? I think it's a, a fantastic campaign. I think if it, do, if it didn't succeed and HS2 goes ahead in both its phases, then we won't achieve the rebalancing we want to achieve and Liverpool could actually, in a sense, be worse off uh, than the position is now. It's as serious as that. And that's why I think we've got to take up what Philip said, which is to up the ante on this now 
and us as Liverpool MPs uh, with Joe and the Council working together, taking every opportunity publicly, including in Parliament, to press this case, but also bluntly for us in the Labour Party to be pressing the case internally that that money that would have to be spent is money well worth spending. H HS3 is pro-poor yeah. and pro-North. Yeah. And, and that the Labour Party shouldn't be in dispute about this. It's the most effective expenditure. If it, just I'll repeat the figures. If we generate 557 million per year mm. in gross value added, and it only costs 1.5 billion to, to do it, I mean, yeah, do the math. Absolutely. I mean, and so, so I find it just mm, yeah. heartbreaking. Heartbreaking that there was. Just to speak to, to Andrew's point. I think we still risk Liverpool not being adequately represented within the matrix mm. of, of the North. I mean, I'm even thinking about the One North context. You know, uh, One North has commissioned uh, consultants to work up their dozen or so transformational projects in the next eight weeks. It's imperative Liverpool is strongly reflected in those vision documents, and it's imperative for our campaign... Um, that actually a direct HS2 link into Liverpool is featured in that. You know, because what we also don't do well as, as Northerners is, is support one another enough. You know, we need to actually recognise that a win for one of us is a win for all of us. And if we can coordinate more effectively, I think, a, across the local authorities, but also across the MPs. I mean, I, wouldn't, I would like the whole of the Labour Party to organise on a Liverpool basis for an east-west lobby. Mm. Create an east-west lobby of all your MPs along the HS2 line. Mm. I'd be delighted to come mm. and speak to them, mm. I'm sure mm. um, uh, Joe would. And we can say, look, this is how to transform... Do you know what, you know what Philip? It's, you're absolutely spot on. Because my experience from chairing the Northern Way Transport Group was that the North never fully appreciated how powerful they could be mm. if they got mm. together. Yeah, because it was too much like the War of the Roses and this side of pennies <laughs> against that. But if the North comes together and starts to lobby in the way that Scotland and London does, exactly. Boy, is it powerful! Do Everyone's you, majority is found there. Yeah, you uh, know, and, yeah. and we've got to make them pay for not. I think the, after I, the, I think the quest, the question, I'd just like to turn it on its head a little bit. It was saying, you know, what what is the sort of negative impact if it doesn't connect? What 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 we can do by the independent surveys that have been done tell you what the impact would be. And the impact would be an 8.3 billion boost to the Liverpool <coughs> city region mm. economy. 8.3 billion pounds. 14,000 new jobs created. Uh, an additional 30 million pounds a year in business rates that of course could be used to spend uh, on services. 20,000 more people looking to make the Liverpool city region their home because of that connectivity uh, issue. 10,000 new houses required, which is a boom for the construction industry. 70, 723,000 additional visitors spending around £87 million supporting <coughs> around 1,740 jobs. These are all the benefits of that. And that's not even talking about the environment, environmental impact and then the connectivity between HS3 either. So you know, there's a huge loss uh, to not just Liverpool and Liverpool City region and also then to Leeds and to right, right the way through the Pennines and across to Hull. The, uh, there's a huge loss to the UK. Yeah. It's absolute mm. madness that we would give that up to uh, it, rather than spending an extra £12 billion to invest or, or, or you know, to make sure that HS3 happens and that 20 miles more into Liverpool, which, as Philip said, we can do things to, to, together with government to make sure that we can deliver that. And it's important that it is also recognised that it is not just about Liverpool. Liverpool is part of the United Kingdom PLC, and if we get that investment, that means that we can help contribute uh, to the UK PLC in terms of GVA across the whole country. Thanks, Joe. I'm, I'm delighted you decided to stay here rather than go to the disco next door. <laughs> <laughs> now, Paul, we didn't... Paul, Paul, we should, should, shall I respond to Paul? Paul? Yeah. Yeah, I thought you'd yeah. you gone, Paul, yeah. Um, Paul said, why can't we? And I think this, this has to be the starting point for this constitutional process that Ed started last week, is devolving as much as possible. The interesting question is what the we is. 
I'm, I'm actually a big fan of city regions. I think city regions are definitely a big part of the way forward, but not all parts of the country have big cities. And there is a debate to be had about what the nature of devolution is in other parts of the country. Philip has spoken very powerfully about um, the impact of, of, of inequality and poverty. And of course, some of the areas where that's the greatest and starkest it's not the cities, actually, it's the coastal areas, some of the coastal areas, particularly on the eastern side of the country. So addressing the nature of devolution for there is important. I personally am reluctant to go down a kind of regional route, as the previous government did. I think city region, something that's more local than that, is a better way forward. But there might be some of these bigger strategic functions where a regional approach might be needed, as well as the city regional approach. And that could include some of the issues we're talking about here tonight. I know, no. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Uh, what time are those finishing it, Philip? Yes, sorry. I mean. How long have we got here tonight? Maybe we've got another. another um, oh, plenty of time. Come on, let's have some more questions. Let's have some ladies coming in. We'll 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 someone who's opposed <laughs> to high speed, too. We'll, we need some balance. We've right? got another half Otherwise, hour. Otherwise, it's a lover. We've got another half hour. Yeah, you tell, tell us where you're from. Just wait for the microphone. Here it comes, yeah. No, 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 no problem, no problem. Hello, um, my name's Georgia Jameson. I work for Carillion, but as you can probably tell, I'm from the northeast. Yeah. Um, and obviously at this event, we're talking a lot about, you know, the benefits to the northern economy uh, of HS2 and HS3, and we're talking about uh, the detriment uh, to it if Liverpool's left behind. But obviously there's, you know, two million people live in the northeast. Uh, there's Newcastle and Sunderland. Uh, there's a huge port at Newcastle which links us to the rest of Europe and I just wanted to hear your views on whether you thought that you know, Newcastle and Sunderland should be connected to the high speed line and how much actually that could benefit the northern economy and help boost the northern powerhouse. Yeah, well done. Uh, Lydia? Hi, I'm, I'm Victoria Barton. I, Sorry, uh, what's Victoria Barton. I'm from Huddersfield, but have lived in London for the last decade. Um, similarly to the previous lady, uh, I work as a political consultant, but tends to be in the infrastructure sector. Um, something that makes me incredibly frustrated is that we tend to talk about sort of Liverpool and Manchester, Manchester and Leeds, and forget there's that other bit, the other side of the Pennines beyond Leeds. Um, to me, it's the M62 corridor, and I actually think it's the most important strip of land in the entire UK because it's where the next general election will be won and it's genuinely the future of the UK. I kind of feel that we're almost limiting ourselves talking about the kind of connections with High Speed 2 and High Speed 3 because there's a wider transport connection hub that can be made. You've got the motorway, you've got two ports at either end yeah. and you've got an airport. Yeah. If you add high speed rail to that, you've got a really truly yeah. transport hub and we continue to have this debate in the southeast about airport capacity and rail capacity and all sorts of other bits and pieces. We can have that debate up here yeah. and we can truly be visionaries and talk about a true transport hub for the UK. And yeah. I just kind of wanted to see what the panel were thinking about that and if it's something anybody approached. You're spot on, Victoria, because we, you know, I'm, I'm guilty too of thinking one north high speed fee, but one north is about airports, it's about highways, it's the whole package. It's about all trucks of connectivity, isn't exactly. it? Uh, now, I want some balance in this debate because I want someone to tell us why high speed 2 is a mistake. <laughs> the, the, um, and the answer is more complicated than that. But, uh, sorry, my name's Kevin Swift. I'm from Wakefield. Now, uh, now, Liverpool isn't the only place that gets left off the HS2 map. Uh, Stoke on Trent aren't very happy, although they're kind of saying they're in favour, but basically they're in favour as long as people make some very, very substantial changes to it. There's a lot of other places get left off. HS2, in my view, to simplify it a little bit, it's a home county's commuter scheme dressed up as a northern regeneration pattern. We turn over three main lines, West Coast Main Line, Midland Main Line, East Coast Main Line. We turn those over to commuter traffic and to semi-fast traffic within 100 miles of London. And it's no surprise that when you get to the north of it, HS2 is not an integrated project at all. It's got a very limited number of places it serves. Liverpool is easily the biggest of the ones it doesn't. And it's not necessary for the purposes of the people in the southeast to have the scheme 
to have the necessary connectivity in the north. Right. All they really want is to get our trains off the tra their, their terminal sections of line that go into Euston, King's Cross, St Pancras. Right. And that's, that's my kind of key position on this. I honestly think it's fundamentally about them getting extra commuter capacity on the chip and then being able to say it's part of a scheme to be nice to the north. HS3, much more complex concept. Give us a question, Kevin. Give us oh, a question. Oh, the question is, um, you know, whether people really think that all the various connectivity shortcomings of HS2, including round Nottingham, not, neither Nottingham nor Derby are connected, can those actually, can those all be remedied without the cost of that scheme starting to reach the kind of levels which the HS2 people claim is just skirmongering, like the 80, 90 million Great. that we've the got a, said. We've got the question. Yeah, uh, you know. Right. Who, do you want to come in first, Joe? Yeah. Let, uh, let's, uh, let's remind you the question. So we've got, jo no, George got, is making I've, a plea for I've got, the North I've East got, in I've Newcastle. Got, you got, got them, eh? <laughs> I mean, with, with, with regards to regard your question, sure, surely, you know, the, for me, I mean, I, I get your point and, and I understand where, where you're coming from. And in some senses, it's linked to Victoria's point because I don't think that the uh, government have any national or uh, regional transport plan. And, and, and for me, I, I, I get where you're coming from, but it shouldn't then therefore be an either or situation. It, 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 you know, what, what I'm talking about uh, is uh, not that, that this is the only investment that's made by central governments of whatever colour in transport and how we improve and modernise our transport system. So there's a case to be had there, but we're talking about two specific schemes, HS2, HS3, and, and I just want to make the case that we go ahead with them and also that we, you know, the, the case for Liverpool, for instance, is quite simply, and it, it comes back to, um, I think it was uh, Georgia made the point around Sunderland and the North East in particular. You know, look, the, the reality is, is, is that um, the One North plan covers that to a certain extent, and that was the core city leaders. Now, Sunderland isn't a core city. Newcastle is a core city. And it was Newcastle, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, uh, Bristol, who made that particular case in Birmingham who made the, the we, we presented the One North documents, it wasn't a government document it was the core cities who presented that document and they've accepted that so so again I, I, I think you know there's a, a, a belief that, that you know, this is um, if you like an effort to connect across from west to east and to cover some of the cities like Sheffield and, and, and uh, right, right through Leeds and right through Manchester and, and others as well to connect up. And I, I, you know, I, I guess what, what, what I'm saying is, is that we, we need, I believe, a really serious uh, national uh, transport plan. We don't have it. And I think we also need to supplement that and complement that, maybe as part of the devolution mm. process, regional plans as well. Mm. And, and, and that's something that I, th I think we need to push for and make sure happens. On, on the point of that regard and Stoke-on-Trent, um, you know, look, I, I, I only make the case, and it's not again a question of saying Liverpool is better than Stoke-on-Trent, of course it is. I'm only messing. I'm only messing. <laughs> I'm only. I'm only kidding you. The, the 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 point is, is that whether we like it or not, HS2 is being determined how it's going to operate, and HS3 has also because it's connecting the west to the east. So you know the arguments for Stoke on Trent is about better modernisation and better connectivity itself, and I'm a, I'm with that. I'm for that. But all I can deal with is what's being presented at the moment. It doesn't mean to say that we don't argue for better connectivity with Stoke-on-Trent or better connectivity with the North East uh, either. We simply have got to invest and we're just debating HS3 and HS2 as a, a question because they're on the table. Yeah, well then, Joe. Now, uh, Victoria, did you get your question answered? You, you were on about connectivity the other side of the pennies. It was more about the change. Yeah. 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 No. I, 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 Victoria, can I just give you one statistic which will back up 100% what you're saying? Because when we were doing the Northern Way transport stuff, um, we looked at connectivity right across the north of England between the major city powerhouses. And there was 40% less commuting than there should have been given the distances 
yeah. and the size of the population. Wow. I'll give you one example. Wow. Compare Manchester and Leeds. You could actually do Manchester and Liverpool as well, Joe, with Edinburgh and Glasgow. Kind of similar sized mm. cities. Distances are not dissimilar. There's 40% more commuting between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Wow. Why is that? Because the transport network is just so much better. And then what we said was, what's the cost to the economies of these city powerhouses because there's so much less commuting? You know, something like five billion pounds cost to the economies. So, you know, it's back to the point I was trying to make at the start. Successive governments have not really focused as much as they should have done on east-west connectivity in the north of England. And it's something that needs to be addressed. Philip? Yeah, I mean... Let, let's think boldly about what we might do to, to turn the state around. Let, let's kind of devolve some powers to the north whereby if all agree and if, for instance, a third of their top priority, they will fund a third of it, the centre has to fund the rest. Because I think from memory, I think and, and something like for every... Um, pound that's spent on transport projects in the north, it's nine pounds in the south. Yep. Now, what, what we have created, therefore, is a, is a terrible situation. Our country is congregating just around one centre at enormous cost to the economy. Think of rent, an entirely unproductive use of capital. Think of the cost of rent for businesses. Think of the rates that rise because rents rise. Think of how much you have to be paid and therefore pay your staff because they have to pay the rents they have to pay. This is all making us, on a macro level, hugely uncompetitive. And if you factor in travel times and building that infrastructure, why can't we take that cost quantify it and actually use that cost and offsetting that cost as a way to help fund projects in the north to grow some other regions where people can live and flourish and be successful. And I think these sorts of powers, mm. so what I'd mm. love to see from, from mm. uh, yourself, Stephen, is some sort of no right of veto for London mm. when we're talking about big northern infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. If the north can demonstrate a case that meets a certain standard mm -hmm. that obviously you will have to centrally set. But if you can say, meet that standard, part fund it, we can't refuse you. That's the sort mm. of constitutional innovation mm. that can absolutely mm. transform social, the, uh, the north of this country. Because then people will have a reason to do it and the case will be there. Great. Just uh, an idea for Thank you. Joe, the back. <laughs> Microphone's coming. I think we can end it. Oh, sorry. Thanks very much. It's uh, great to see such a great consensus in the room between HS2, HS3, and the links between them. Of course, there's no link between HS2 and... Where, where, where is it you're from? Can you your name? I'm the, PPC in, uh, I'm the PPC in Arvon in North Wales. Oh. Uh-huh. Um, there's no connection, of, of course, between HS2 and HS1. Um, how long do you think people... Yeah on the panel think before we can get on a train in Manchester and get off in Paris mm. or in Leeds to Frankfurt yeah. without having to walk a couple of hundred yards down the Euston Road. Well, yeah, I'm going to come to that. I'm doing them in threes. I'm going to answer that one myself. Gentlemen, here. Um, hi, uh, Johnny Roberts uh, from uh, Newbury CLP, so a bit of a voice uh, from the south. Um, mainly to tie together all of the questions that people have been asking this last round. Yeah and that uh, Joe was saying, we definitely need a national plan for high-speed rail because, as David said at the very beginning, you say HS2, you say HS3, we all agree, well, most of us seem to agree that that's a great idea, but everyone will be asking in Bristol, Cardiff, Edinburgh, they'll all be asking, where's HS4, yeah. HS5? Why can't we just all get around a table and say, right, what is the plan for, it might take us 70 years to build it, but what is the plan? So we can plan now HS network that connects all of the major cities uh, rather than just sort of doing HS3 until some people get their act together and put forward a plan for HS4, HS5 and what have you and do it so ad hoc. Great. Uh, third question? Oh, lady here, yeah, sorry. Thank you. My name is Sheila McNerney. I'm working with Res Publica and the 20 Miles More. Campaign. Sorry, what's your name? Sheila McNerney. 
I'm working with ResPublica and the 20 Miles More campaign in Liverpool on some of the detailed research and detailed work. Um, it's absolutely fascinating debate. I'm from Liverpool originally. I've lived and worked in Manchester for 30 years. So that's a long story. Um, and I'm fascinated by some of the discussions about the fact we are all interconnected. We do actually need each other as part of this big economic jigsaw. So the, the competition that we're forced into in a discussion about what about Liverpool and then we're saying what about Stoke and what about Newcastle. There's an interconnectedness that we do need to work out and I think um, there's, there's a fantastic opportunity right now. I think the idea of a grand plan, a grand national plan, was lost during the recession. I think our ambitions were, were crushed during that recession. And we're coming out of that now. And this, this idea of a grand plan, I think, is fantastic. And there is no need for us to exclude places in that plan. Um, interestingly, I, I, through my work in Manchester and Liverpool, it's really fascinating. Manchester's economic plan needs Liverpool to thrive now. There's a connectedness between these two cities yeah. that I think is part of the opportunity. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to make those comments and I'm yeah. interested in the idea of places competing when actually we don't need to compete Great. in that Thank way. Thank you, Sheila. Now, HS1, HS2, th that link was kind of scrapped, but scrapped really by David Higgins because it was viewed as too costly. There was all sorts of problems at uh, Camden. I have a view that there's a bit of freight line with two that can connect HS1 and HS2 without much cost. One of the challenges is what do you do at passport control? Right? That's one of the challenges that's got to be overcome. But I must admit, it doesn't really feel right that HS1 and HS2 don't connect, does it? I mean, it's intuitively, you know, <laughs> this does no. not make a lot of sense, right? So, so we, 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 need to come, we need to come back to... Uh, and, and Euston and St Pancras are not far away from They're not from really one very far. No, they're really not. <laughs> uh, now, we had the point from Jonathan about a national plan for high-speed rail. Anyone? I, 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 just as a thought, just on the national plan, national plans can't be done from the centre. We've got to, in some sense, it's a bit like my uh, question to Stephen, we've got to, it's a bit like a mm. network, we've got to reward people for turning on their own network, and we've got to create self-funding infrastructure projects that essentially people can switch on without Westminster doing 20 years of studies. And if we, can, if we can create that so that people are prepared to take a, a risk and the state then is, is essentially priced out of the risk curve, it can just fund without much audit at all. That's the only way to create a, a, a networking solution. It can't be planned from the centre. It's got to be individual cities linking with us and saying we must do this and resourcing it by capturing land value and capturing the growth that comes into the region in some way. Great. And I think you agree with Sheila's point about... Absolutely right. And I'm, I'm just, I was thinking about what Philip had just said and, and, and Johnny and Sheila's points, because clearly there does need to be a national priority given. Um, but you then need learning again from what David said before from Scotland and London to have the real power lying at the local or regional level to determine what happens. Now some of this obviously by its nature it's high speed rail it cuts across regions and therefore there does need to be that element of national planning. The only other thing I'd say is we do need to plan and we need to get everyone involved in planning but not at the price of never doing it. Mm. Wonderful. Well look, that, that brings the uh, tonight's proceedings to, to an end. Uh, what a fascinating discussion we've had, haven't we? Great panellists. Well done for putting there. And it's really good to, to see a different slant on things. Um, well, really, I mean... And it's great to see how passionate you are about rebalancing the economy. But I like that. I like what you said thank you. earlier. Now, just a few points to finish on. Um, the new Chief Executive of Construction at High Speed 2 is Simon Kirby. And he's a passionate Liverpool fan. You want a lobby? Up. I won't hold it against him. I'm a blue it. nose. Yeah. I'm an Evertonian. That's a very good piece of insight. Because I could snow ice with me. Then. You want to keep that quiet when you meet I want meet to keep that there. quiet, yeah. <laughs> um, just, a, just another bit, bit of information I want to kind of share with you about how the North needs to be better organised. I remember the 2009 Labour Party conference here in Manchester. Mm. Ruth Kelly was Secretary of State for Transport. She asked to see me the night before she was making her conference speech. And she says, David, I'm going to announce tomorrow that we're going to approve Crossrail in London. And she said to me, how will this go down? 
in the north of England. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not going to go down well, Ruth, because North England think London's getting everything anyway. She says, what can we do to redress the balance? And I said, the Northern Hub, formerly called the Manchester Hub, benefit cost ratio of four to one. So a week later, she got the Department for Transport and the Treasury to support the Northern Hub. Now, I have a question for you. Why was the Northern Hub not invested in 20 years ago? Mm. 30 years ago. What's the reason for that? And I'll tell you what the reason is. Is that collectively the north of England doesn't appreciate just how strong politically Absolutely. it is. Absolutely right. right. And I'll tell you what, the sum of the parts are so much greater than the parts. And Joe, you know, it's great that on H High Speed 3, that Liverpool is going to be connected to High Speed 3 when it's built. You want to get one north fully behind Liverpool being connected to High Speed 2. That's not because if one not comes and says to the government, the Treasury, we want Liverpool on high speed too. It's imperative in that report that a direct link to Liverpool is in that report. But the, yeah. That consultancy that's been put together. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. I, I, I guess what, what, what I, I get from that sort of uh, little story that, that you've just told it, it is for me, uh, it comes, uh, I, I think, and connects the constitutional issue because. Right. You know, when a uh, Labour government minister uh, at the time argues or asks the question, uh, how do you think this will go down in, in, in the conference? I, I think it uh, sums up the disconnect uh, between Parliament uh, and right. the North and the cities and the poorest cities as well. And, and that, to me, is, is absolutely clear. You know, the reality is, the reality is, is that Liverpool, uh, Manchester, Leeds, Birmingham, all the core cities need to argue, and it comes back to Philip's point as well about, you know, invest to earn. We all need central government funding, but we all need to be able to raise funding to spend in our own way. And that's why it's absolutely crucial that we take this window of opportunity to ram home the decentralisation issue and the devolution message. We've now got to make sure that that happens. We can't take our foot off the pedal. Well, then, Joe, that's, that's it. Great. We'll put it right at the time. Round Thank of applause for our uh, panellists. And well done for organising this. Well done. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, some thanks to the chair. That's some of the most inspired chairing I've seen in a long time. Yeah. Thank, well, you thank, you thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Yeah, don't talk about Manchester noise nuisance. <laughs> <laughs>